Hare Krishna followers are a familiar sight on the streets of London and many Western cities. Since the movement arrived from India 16 years ago, many young people have been persuaded to abandon their Western lifestyle and devote themselves to this Eastern religion. The rules are strict, the life difficult. In this, the third program in our series on the cults, we go inside Hare Krishna. Two o'clock in the morning, the Hare Krishna Temple in London's West End. The start of another day for Tim Webster, a 23-year-old Londoner. Tim's first thought is to fix his mind on God by continually chanting his name. His mind is allowed to wander away from God only during sleep. Dedicated followers of Krishna, like Tim, are called devotees. They believe in simple living and high thinking. After a cold shower, Tim spends two hours chanting and reading from ancient scriptures. The beliefs and practices of Hare Krishna come from the traditional religion of India, Hinduism. Devotees believe in reincarnation and in one God. God has taken many forms, they believe, the original and most perfect of them being Krishna, who was alive on earth 5,000 years ago. Each devotee has vowed to chant the names of God, Hare, Krishna and Rama, at least 1,700 times a day. Devotees have adopted not just their beliefs, but also their appearance from India. We wear a very simple uh, cloth, the dhoti, simply one piece of cloth tied in a certain way. And uh, we shave the head, which is a symbol of renunciation. Branshaw has been a devotee for over ten years. Devotees like him are expected to live a spiritual life in the temple, devoted completely to Krishna. The particular significance of the uh, tilak, as it's called, this mark here. This, this mark is made from clay taken from the Ganges sacred river in India. This actually marks the footprint of God on the forehead of a devotee to symbolize the surrender at the feet of God as the servant of God. A tuft of hair or sika is left at the back of the head. It covers what is believed to be a particularly sensitive spot through which the most spiritually advanced individuals will leave their bodies when they die. The devotees all attend four services each morning, the first at 4.30. This, later on, is the greeting of the deities. Hare Krishna devotees believe God is present on earth in the form of his names. So much of the service consists simply of chanting God's names. This is one of the easiest, most direct ways of showing our appreciation of God's beauty and trying to serve him in our lives. Anyone, even a child, can sing the name of God. The name of God is, according to our understanding, the name is non-different from God himself. As soon as I say the, the sound Krishna, Krishna or God is actually present in that sound. The deities in the temple, representing several different forms of God, have been bathed, dressed and decorated for the day. For the Hare Krishna devotees, God is a real person. Literally, Krishna means the most beautiful person, the most attractive person. Everyone is looking for someone beautiful, someone attractive to give their love to. And as devotees, we have found that person in Krishna or God. The devotees have dedicated their lives to serving God not just through worship, but in every action, including work. Tim Webster works in the kitchens of the vegetarian restaurant run by the movement. Cooking for Tim is more than just a job. I think when I'm cooking, I'm actually cooking for God. I'm not cooking for myself, you see. So we give up selfish desires. So everybody's trying to fulfill themselves, you see. 
but we're trying to satisfy God. So that's why our life is spiritual. It's now 8.30. Tim is over six hours into his daily routine. 20 degrees centigrade. The outlook for Saturday were warm and humid. And once A few again, miles away, it's still only breakfast time for his parents in their South London flat. Tim is the youngest of Mr and Mrs Webster's three children. All have left home now, and Tim's father has retired from his job as a building worker. Mrs Webster remembers her son changing during his teenage years. Well, he used to uh, go to discos, go to the pub at the weekend, go out with girlfriends and bring a few of them home, and uh, sort of like a normal teenage boy would be. And then as he got older, he said that he would like to go to India to study the religion out there, and we weren't very, very keen on that, but... Uh, as we both said, well, he was old enough then to do what he wanted to do. And uh, he went up to the uh, temple in Soho. There are probably as many reasons for joining the Hare Krishna movement as there are devotees. For Tim, his family life and social life with friends were simply not enough. He took up karate, an ancient form of self-defense first developed by Buddhist monks, and he became interested in the spiritual side of karate. As a result, he began to question what he was doing with his life and where it was leading to. And I think, is it, you know, is this really, is this really happiness? You know, is this what we're, and that was when I was young. That was when I was 20, you know, trying to enjoy these kind of things. I thought, what about when I'm 50? Where my pleasure come from then? If I'm 20 now and this is the height of my pleasure, when I'm 50, what kind of pleasure will I get then? Dissatisfaction with their present life in one way or another is the reason why many of the devotees turn to Hare Krishna. To the outsider, the lifestyle chosen as an alternative by these young people appears alien and exotic. It is undeniably a hard life. The devotees have few home comforts and few personal possessions. They live by strict vows which forbid them to eat meat or to take any intoxicants, including tea and coffee. Hobbies and entertainments are regarded as frivolous unless directed towards Krishna. They remain celibate until marriage. Hare Krishna was brought to young Westerners in 1965 by a 70-year-old Indian, Swami Prabhubad, who had never before left India. Prabhupada travelled penniless to New York, where he founded the first temple and initiated 8,000 people into what he called Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada died three years ago. Life-size models of him now occupy a place of honour in Krishna temples. Some of the last years of his life were spent at a manor house near Watford, a gift to Hare Krishna from one of the Beatles, George Harrison. Prabhupada's study is kept as a shrine. Fresh flowers are placed there every day. The study is cleaned carefully and the day's page in the diary turned. Though Prabhupada is dead, his mission lives on the mission of spreading Krishna consciousness in the West. So take one of these, give it a read, I think you'll enjoy it. You look quite intelligent, okay? And uh, when are you going back to uh, Denmark? No, a few weeks, something like that. Hare Krishna devotees like to do their preaching on the street, in the tradition of Indian holy men. Street encounters also provide an opportunity to pass on some of the 90 million books and magazines published by the movement. This is our address here. We have one at Temple. Young people are invited to visit the London Temple for a free meal. We do a vegetarian meal, free of charge, every day. There's one for you, okay? At this stage, everybody is welcome. Reincarnation, karma, these sort of things. And you can ask questions. If this soul is eternal, what is the relationship between this eternal soul and Krishna? Oh, what is our relationship? There are so many different relationships, just like here in this material world. For many who come, the food is probably more important than the preaching. You know, sometimes there are problems with uh, bums when I come in here. So all your bums come up here and uh, try to get a free meal and everything off them all the time. The act of giving food is important to the devotees. It demonstrates the success of their community, as well as advertising their lifestyle and beliefs. 
The Krishna Consciousness Movement has used Western technology and enterprise to spread its message further afield. This is probably the only 32-ton articulated temple in the world. It's named after Lord Chaitanya, the Indian saint who brought about a revival of devotion to Krishna in the 16th century. The travelling temple cost 25,000 pounds and has clocked up 20,000 miles visiting festivals and exhibitions. The aim is to take Krishna consciousness to every town in Britain. Inside the 40-foot trailer are a kitchen, showers and a library, as well as a temple. Visitors to this travelling temple are supposed to experience some of the peace and beauty of Krishna. Those who want to know more are likely to come here, Chaitanya College in Worcestershire, where the travelling temple is based. This country house was acquired by the movement in 1979. It now houses a community of 150. It's here that would-be devotees learn the beliefs and practices of their calling. At this stage, Hare Krishna are highly selective about the sort of person they want. Well, we wouldn't accept anyone uh, with a criminal record or if they had a very bad debt to society or financial debt. Uh, we wouldn't accept someone who was uh, simply looking for a place uh, to live and to eat uh, because we're a very hard-working society, very hard-working community, and we expect every member to pull uh, his or her weight. Cared by one devotee and another. There are no quick conversions. The introductory course lasts three months. 40% of the trainees will leave within the first year. For devotees to practice the trainees must learn to cultivate the 26 qualities of the pure devotee. Instruction is based on the Vedas, the oldest of the world's scriptures, which are believed to have originated in India 5,000 years ago. Indian traditions are preserved. In the background is an exact replica of the deities in the Jagannath Puri temple in India. The original carving, which is thousands of years old, was never finished by the craftsman. But because the craftsman was a highly respected devotee, local people painted the incomplete forms of Krishna and worshipped them. The Hare Krishna devotees in Worcestershire do the same today. The trainees learn to follow a Vedic lifestyle, a simple spiritual life involving control of the bodily senses and a controlled vegetarian diet. As in India, the cow is sacred. Hare Krishna has the first cow protection program in Europe. Cattle are cared for in return for some light work. For Krishna devotees, killing a cow which gives milk is the same as killing one's mother, and anyone who slaughters an innocent animal is doomed to return to this earth after death and suffer a similar fate himself. Given the Indian roots of their beliefs, it's hardly surprising that Hare Krishna has worked hard to cultivate strong ties with the Indian community in this country. Immigrant Indians are the main source of financial support, donating £250,000 a year to the movement. Hare Krishna claimed 20,000 life members, almost all of them Indian, who each pay £200 for the privilege. The life members regard the temple as Christians do their church. They form the lay congregation who follow the teachings of Krishna while, unlike the devotees, living a conventional life in Western society. Dr. Vishnu Sharma is a lecturer in law, a magistrate, and a life member of Krishna consciousness. You don't have to be a devotee. You don't have to live in the temple. The people who live in the temple, especially if it's called, they are going to be trained as I, they are going to be trained as I see priests. They will, uh, they will teach other people about Krishna consciousness. But you can also be a Krishna conscious by staying at home. For example, my whole, whole family is Krishna conscious. We believe in the strict principles enunciated by Lord Krishna. No meat eating, no illicit sex, no drinking, and all those four principles. <laughs> For many Hindus, the Hare Krishna devotees are equivalent to Christian monks. These young Westerners, themselves converted to an Indian religion, are now carrying the faith back to the Indian community. Yet even in the West, the movement's values and lifestyle 
remain those of a traditional India. Marriages, for instance, are arranged in the traditional Indian fashion. Before a marriage can take place, the temple president must give his consent. The young girl will, or the young boy will come to see me and she will request, to, or he will request to be married. Uh, generally, my first question is, uh, do you have anybody in mind? Of course, in our movement, uh, the boys and girls work together, so generally they have some idea of who they want to marry. And then my job as the sort of guardian of that person, as the temple president, is to consult the other partner and to see if he's agreeable. And from that point on, uh, there's an engagement period, three or four months when they work more closely together and sit and talk together. And when they're really sure that um, they get on very nicely, then we arrange for a wedding. Today is Madhavendra Puri's wedding day. He spends some time before the ceremony studying the scriptures and meditating on them. He doesn't see his bride until the ceremony. This Indian wedding has no legal standing in this country. Madhavendra and his bride Draupadi were legally married in a register office a year ago, but they've observed the vows of celibacy until their marriage can be solemnized according to Vedic rites. The marriage vows are made over a sacrificial fire. An Indian couple who are life members are also to be married. Uh, of course, in our society, the most important consideration is that each partner will help each other spiritually. Uh, the material compatibility must be there, but for the husband to be a suitable spiritual help, or, and also for the wife to be a spiritual help to the husband. This is very important. Marriage is for life. There is no divorce. Each couple must promise to bring up their offspring according to the Vedic scriptures. In Chaitanya College in Worcestershire, the first generation of Western children are now being brought up in Krishna consciousness. Some of the children's parents live here as well, but other parents are devotees in the Watford or London temples, and they see their children only at weekends. The children live under the same disciplines as the adult devotees. First of all, they're rising early. They rise at 3.30 in the morning. They bathe and uh, dress in clean clothing. Then they go to the temple for uh, the morning service, which is at 4.15 a.m. And uh, then uh, the children here, who are of school age, they go back to their ashrams. Now, an ashram is like a house, just like in any boarding school. There are houses and there are housemasters. So uh, these uh, children live in ashrams within the community. And um, so at, at that time, they're, they're learning chanting and, and they're reading. They're, they're studying uh, the Vedic scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. All right. I'm just going to go around the class. I want to see who had them all right and who didn't. Raghulekha, can you give me the answer to three sets of five? The rest of the morning is taken up with conventional schooling. The class is taken by a trained teacher. Who has an answer then for three sets of five? The I subjects think. taught are the usual ones. Prema. In the classroom, as everywhere else, Krishna is at the center of things. On this side, you've got nine sets of three. The children's afternoon is short because they have to be in bed early. This afternoon, the boys are putting on a play. The teachings of Krishna consciousness again play a central role.
The Hare Krishna children are being brought up to be as devoted to God as their parents are. Go away! Get lost! Clear off! Yeah! Clear it! Obviously we're hoping they'll remain as devotees within the Hare Krishna society, although when they reach uh, a mature age, between 16 and 18 years of age, it's up to them and uh, they can decide you know, how to uh, live their life. But obviously if, if they're very uh, trained up nicely to uh, um, keep Krishna within the heart, within the center of their activities, this will remain with them their whole lives. And for some of the children, if they're academically qualified, then we're hoping that uh, they'll go on to university. The children themselves seem happy enough at the moment. So far their contact with the outside world has been extremely limited. When this changes as the children get older, no doubt many of them will begin to question this adopted lifestyle. Such conflicts have already occurred between parents outside Hare Krishna and their children who have joined the movement. Some parents have objected strongly to their children giving up family and friends, or sometimes education and careers, in order to serve Krishna. Mr. Webster remembers the shock when his son Tim joined Hare Krishna. If you'd have seen Tim before, so it was just in a joke, in it, or say on the Saturday, he did have a lovely head of hair. But when we saw him on the Monday, he came in the door, well, his mother nearly fainted. And that's putting it mildly. Well, I'd, I was very upset to start with because it was something that I'd never really heard about before. Although Tim had bought a few books on the Harry Christian, I hadn't really looked at them. It's, it's difficult for them to understand, you know, they're not used to, especially being an Eastern religion, Eastern philosophy. She said to me it would be different if you joined a, 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 a normal church. Maybe then I could understand. But I know even if I did that, she still wouldn't understand if I took to a completely kind of different way of life and what I've been leading. Parental hostility to movements like Hare Krishna is the reaction which is almost always reported. But this is by no means the whole story. Tim Webster still keeps in touch with his parents and visits them regularly. Hello. His parents have found their attitude to Hare Krishna changing. Come in. I've got some flowers in there for your temple. Thank you. Where's that beautiful garment? Oh, thank you. Both my husband and I have since realized that uh, he is very happy doing what he is. And when we've come in contact with the devotees, there isn't any harm in them. And. Uh, it is a austere life. It's not as if he's going into a life of luxury, sort of getting up at two in the morning. And, and it isn't, a, as I say, a, a life that we would have thought that he would take up. But as he did, we just had to wish him luck and uh, hope that everything turned out all right for him. The Hare Krishna devotees themselves, of course, consider that they've gained much more than they've lost by following the Krishna calling. Of course, to the outsider, sometimes it appears that the devotees are, are leading a very renounced, austere kind of life. Sometimes people say, but what do you do? How can anyone exist in such a, uh, an atmosphere? Of course, the fact is that the devotees are very happy. We don't feel as if we're giving up a tremendous amount. We feel quite satisfied because we have so much more to live for in our lives we have a very deep feeling of satisfaction derived from serving Krishna and from seeing our, our own spiritual life unfold before us as the years go by. The devotees believe their way of life will bring not just happiness on earth, but eternal happiness. They're only too glad to escape from a Western style of life they consider godless and decadent, but they don't regard this as running away question of running away you know we're not actually meant to uh, live a completely materialistic way of life and then at the end of it have nothing to show you know? we're running to a spiritual way of life we're running to find God 
It's through their single-minded devotion to God that Hare Krishna devotees believe they will escape from an endless cycle of reincarnation and leave behind forever the miseries of this earthly existence. At the time of this body dying, the soul lives on. And the whole goal of the practice of Krishna consciousness is to find the final resting place of the soul in loving uh, relationship with God. Thank you.